Hey everyone, it's Dr. Z. Okay, today's guest has been on the show before, David Stukas, Dave Stukas, Diamond Dave, is a pediatric allergist at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. He is very well known across social media platforms, Twitter and Instagram as Allergy Kids Doc educating and uh, entertaining about pediatric allergy and allergies in general, and he's been a voice of reason. Today, we have him on the show because he and his colleagues have developed a way of dealing with our outpatient struggles around the COVID-19 epidemic, pandemic. We've talked a lot about inpatient struggles and how we're gonna deal with the lack of masks, et cetera, but what about our outpatient colleagues? I've had messages from, frontline doctors in private practice who feel like they're gonna go out of business because patients are afraid to come to them. How do they handle uh, 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 contagiousness and issues like that? There's a million questions and Dave Stukas has a million answers. Diamond Dave, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Z-Dog. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. That mustache is so sexy. Uh, I just wanted to get that out of the way first. Yeah, you know, this is uh, <laughs> this is new. Um, I have not been walking around like this. This is the first year I grew out a beard, so I've had a beard all winter. Uh, and I did not intend to shave, uh, but I now need to be fitted for an N95 mask in case I come into contact uh, with somebody who's COVID-19. Uh, my wife is not very uh, happy with my choices right now to, to kind of deconstruct slowly. Uh, but to be honest with you, um, I kind of came on with the mustache because this is a shout out to all of our, our colleagues on the front line. Uh, this is a, a minor, minor sacrifice in my life, uh, but there are thousands of our colleagues who are, you know, putting their lives at risk every single day to help care for patients in this unprecedented pandemic. So anything that I can do to help raise awareness and, and give all those great folks a shout out, I'm happy to do it, even hey, if I look like this. Dude, you look dope. And I got to say this, what you said about our frontline healthcare practitioners is something that we've been banging a drum on that uh, as this category five hurricane starts to spin up, we're seeing something unprecedented in our careers. I've never seen anything like it. And I've talked about the comparisons to H1N1, swine flu and things like that. It's looking now because of a lot of fumbling in the early response that we are going to see something very, very, very different than that. And uh, um, the question on the outpatient side, Dave, because you're a pediatric allergist, so you're typically working in the outpatient world as opposed to me, I'm a hospitalist. So I always focus on this hospital side. But you know, again, people have reached out and they're really concerned how they're gonna run their practices, keep patients safe. What happens if one of their staff members gets exposed or sick? Because a two week quarantine for a staff member for a small practice means that practice is out of business. So I'm curious, again, you and your colleagues have developed something. Teach us teach us what to do. Yeah, this is unprecedented, unprecedented times, unprecedented uh, rapidity with how this was developed. Uh, two authors, Marcus Shaker and Matthew Greenhot, spearheaded an, an effort uh, with 21 co-authors where we, we got together and wrote a consensus white paper guideline document in about 24, 36 hours. And we got the three major allergy organizations in North America uh, to post it to their website just a couple of days ago and one of the leading allergy journals to do an expedited you know, peer review and publish it. Uh, this is really within a week. That's uh, crazy. Un That's unprecedented. Yeah. It, it does not happen this fast. But I think that, you know, this is a testament to uh, not only the, the authors who started it, but leadership in our in our specialty. And allergists, you know, we, we have longstanding relationships with our patients. The majority of allergists in our country and really across the world are working in the outpatient setting. Um, and we wanted to give them some sort of guidance in regards to what to do should they need to rapidly shut down or, or transition the care that they're delivering. That makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense that you guys would be leading the charge on this. And what, so what, there's sort of a three tiers or so that we were gonna discuss about how an outpatient practice can start to deal with the influx of uh, COVID patients and also their regular patients in the setting of people being on lockdown, in the setting of people being very scared. I just did a piece uh, about how we're seeing the stigmatization of healthcare professionals. So uh, uh, out in the public, uh, nurses are getting sprayed with Lysol. They're getting berated for stepping out into public. And it's been absolutely heartbreaking to see because these are the people who are risking their lives, right? But then you have these practices. So, so what, what t teach us about this. Like, how do we manage this as an outpatient practice? You know, how do you think about this? How do you structure this? 
Yeah, I, you know, I, I want to acknowledge kind of what you mentioned. The, it's a tale of two worlds. You know, on the inpatient side, you know, I work at a major academic institution. I'm getting updates, you know, almost hourly from leadership. We're having meetings. We're prepared. My wife is a pediatric emergency room doctor. Uh, you know, I have that information. I know what the preparedness is, and we're ready to go. But if you're out in the community in solo practice or, you know, in a small group uh, in rural areas or you're not getting these updates, they're just ill-prepared and they're not, they're not getting the information that they need to protect their patients, their staff, and to know what to do. Um, so you mentioned sort of the three tiers and, you know, it's really one is safety. Um, how do you deal with somebody in your office who may potentially have COVID-19? Um, you know, what do you do about testing, which, as you know, is, it's just a giant mess right now. and We don't have testing available. Um, and then the second part is, you know, how do you prepare to kind of shut down your business? I mean, this is the livelihood of our colleagues out in outpatient in the outpatient world. Um, you know, we care for patients, and you know, this is why we do this is because we want to help people and make their lives better. But at the end of the day, if patients aren't coming to your office, you're going to go out of business. Uh, and then, you know, the third part is, you know, how do you transition the uh, traditional approach of seeing patients in the office to maybe more of a telemedicine approach? Uh, to continue to provide the care to patients. Um, you know, we want to help people through this crisis. Uh, and there's a lot of layers to this and there's a lot of preparation that needs to go into it. Yeah. So let me ask a dumb question. What if you just wanted to Skype with a patient and HIPAA, it's a HIPAA violation. Uh, is HIPAA suspended? Like what's going on? Like how, how do we deal with just the logistics of, we can talk about safety, but let's talk about the logistics of taking care of patients uh, in a non-face-to-face way. Yeah, you know, telemedicine has been around for decades. Uh, It's been slow to be adopted for a lot of reasons. One is just because the technology and people aren't comfortable with it. You know, you do a great job of talking about how complicated it is to use an electronic medical record. Throw telemedicine into the fray and it just makes it even more complicated. And then there's patient privacy and then there's reimbursement and billing. And this is state by state and it's been really slow to adopt. Well, this week alone, it's been you know, inspirational to see a lot of the major insurance companies and payers step up and say, listen, uh, we're going to cover this. We need to transition. We're going to figure this out. And even state medical boards now are saying that we're going to loosen restrictions. Uh, so it really took a global pandemic to allow for rapid changes and, uh, you know, hopefully full deployment of telemedicine, because I think that's the way to go. Yeah, I'm with you a thousand percent. I think we're going to see societal shifts and shifts in our healthcare system that are unprecedented in a rapidity. You know, kind of like in wartime, we see a lot of changes in technology and social uh, structures. This is effectively like a wartime now where we're having to mobilize in a quick and rapid and and flexible way. So from a from an outpatient standpoint, how would you guys recommend people employ telemedicine now, especially if they've not done it before, they don't know what's going on? Yeah, so there's a lot of guidance that's being put out, you know, as we speak, and this is changing day to day. So first, I would say, you know, start with your state. What, what state do you work in? Uh, go to the Department of Health because there's a lot of information there. Uh, and there's just tons of in- information even being put out by the insurance providers as we speak. So, you know, it won't take very long to do some digging and find uh, the options that are available. And then it's really just finding the right platform. And there are, you know, probably dozens of them at this point. Right. Do they integrate with your um, electronic medical record? Do you do it separately? How do you maintain patient privacy? How do you bill and reimburse? These are just different issues that, you know, people have to kind of navigate on their own. So, you know, part of what this document did was it, it raised the idea of now is the time. Uh, you know, as, as allergists, we, we see a lot of patients who have common conditions. Allergies and asthma affect millions of children and adults. But a lot of these outpatient visits are non-essential. So how can we transition those non-essential visits towards the telehealth model? And then we steer, excuse me, steer them towards more resources where they can individualize on their own. And for other specialists out there or primary care, you know, physicians, you, you know, think about the common things that you see in the office setting and start thinking about what can you transition to telemedicine as well. That makes perfect sense because you're offloading the stuff that really bears, uh, it's so repetitive and it's so manageable at a distance that you don't need someone to come in. And the question historically has always been, we've not been incentivized also to do that because you don't get paid for that. It's much, it's much more remunerative if you have a patient come in with a cold and you go, you have a cold, don't do anything, Take, drink some fluids, right? But the danger of having to give them a pack or caving into their anxiety or pattern is so high. So this may actually improve care in the long run. Um, we've talked to quite a few telehealth 
uh, companies is since this crisis started, and some of them are going to come on our show. You know, everybody from like doing tele nursing to, to you know, tele um, tele COVID triage. You know, because this has been a problem. I, you know, I know people that are sitting on the phone with a triage nurse waiting to be heard for three hours to say, okay, I have a sore throat and a headache, and I had an exposure. Can I get tested? And they say, stay home, or they say whatever, right? So from an allergy standpoint, like, so is there um, particular guidance in the documents you put together, or is it what you basically said, go find the resources and use them, because now Medicare may even pay for this, right? Yeah, there, there's all kinds of, you know, um, directions towards e-supplements and, and more in-depth discussion about it. Uh, and then we even break it down just by condition that we see. Uh, um, you know, right now it's, it's spring tree pollen season. So we have millions of people that are already coughing because of their allergies or asthma. And then if you're asking screening questions of every patient that walks in, whether they've, they've had fever or cough, you're going to get red flags left and right. So this is really a complicated issue at this time. Um, and we need to figure it out fast. D- D- Dave, can I ask a dumb question? This is a dumb yeah. internist question. Can allergies like that, tree pollen allergies, cause fever? And if so, what type of fever typically do we see? Yeah, so it's a misnomer. These are often referred to as hay fever. Um, so you actually don't get a fever when you have seasonal allergies. Um, but if you have poorly controlled allergic rhinitis, that's going to set you up to have sinus infections and, and real infection on top of that. Um, and that could pre- you know, present with a fever. Or you're just going to get the typical viruses that circulate this time of year. But allergies themselves don't cause that. Perfect. Yeah, because there are a lot of people saying, you know, I have a, a little bit of a fever. I think it's my allergies. And, and I'm like, mm, I don't think that's right, um, typically. Yeah. And, you know, that's another part of all of this sort of uh, preparedness of it's it, the communication piece. So how can we communicate with our patients in a rapid turnaround time? So what's your website capabilities? What are you doing on social media? What kind of, you know, a frequently asked question document can you put together to circulate? We gave that information in this consensus guideline about what you can do and, and some templates that you can use. Uh, and these are some easy things, you know, so we we'll use the allergies and asthma as an example. How do I tell the difference between COVID-19 versus seasonal allergies? Well, COVID-19 is going to be pretty acute. It's going to make you sick for about 14 days, will likely cause fever in addition to cough, and some of the symptoms may overlap. Whereas if you have seasonal allergies, that's going to last weeks to months. Itching is a big part of that, and you won't have a fever. Um, so if you can differentiate and say, oh, I'm like itching like crazy, my eyes are swollen shut, and I don't have a fever, that's more likely pollen allergies compared to COVID-19. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And in terms of, um, and this distinguishing allergies from this, distinguishing a common cold from this, distinguishing influenza from this, this is why we needed that rapid testing and we still haven't seen it. So what are you thinking in terms of um, uh, when outpatients do have a high suspicion, how are you referring them? Yeah, I think this is, this differs based upon where you are. Uh, I live in Ohio and, you know, our governor was one of the, the first in the nation to really, you know, put in place public health measures, uh, shutting down large gatherings, uh, social distancing early on, shutting down bars and restaurants and things like that. So our situation here may be different from another state where they're lagging behind and they haven't really seen a lot of, you know, cases of COVID-19, although they will very soon. Um, or, you know, perhaps the policymakers aren't, aren't on, on the ball in regards to that. So the screening does differ. And, and so it goes back to what does your current health department say in regards to screening? Um, ours has changed even. Uh, you know, now it's really fever and cough or close contact with anybody who traveled from one of the, the high risk countries, which, you know, now that with the travel restrictions, that's that question is probably going to go by the wayside. And frankly, now that we have community wide spread in most places, a lot of these questions are obsolete. Uh, so you have to stay on top of it and adjust accordingly. Exactly. Now, from a safety standpoint, what are you guys saying uh, in terms of how you're handling patients oh, with cool. symptoms, et cetera? Yeah. So, you know, somebody walks into your outpatient office and if you're still seeing patients and a lot of allergists already have already transitioned, it's been amazing, amazing how fast they've been able to adapt to this. So it can happen. But, you know, somebody walked in your office and they throw up a red flag because they do have a fever and cough or exposure to somebody with known COVID-19 or travel to those high risk areas. You have to whisk them into a room immediately. You have to isolate them and keep them away from everybody else in your office. At an academic institution such as mine, we have rapid response teams and we can call the ID folks who can come down and assess and, and tell us what to do next. If you're out in the community on your own, that shuts down your practice. Mm. And then what if that patient ultimately tests positive for COVID-19? They've exposed everybody in the office. They've exposed everybody in the waiting room. They've exposed your staff. So even if those people actually don't develop infection, they likely need to be tested if it's available or undergo a 14-day quarantine. 
So even if you know allergists or other outpatient providers aren't willing to shut down, and there's a lot of reasons why they wouldn't be, because financial burden is going to be huge. Inevitably, they may be forced to do it whether they like it or not. Mm. And see, that's. Uh, do you have policies in what your uh, guidelines are saying? Which, by the way, we're going to link to all these in the in the description and in the notes on the website and on YouTube, et cetera. Do you have any guidelines for what people should be doing about? quarantine and sick leave and what constitutes an exposure because man i tell you there everybody's going to be exposed because at some point patients are going to come in I'm, I'm hearing from docs around the country and nurses around the country they're like yeah we had a covid19 positive patient show up didn't get diagnosed for three days because no testing ended up exposing everybody but everybody's not going to quarantine i mean and then they can potentially spread it to vulnerable patients i mean how are we thinking about that yeah you know it's <laughs> I still can't get over how fast this has changed. We wrote this a week ago, and we put in, you know, green zone, yellow zone, orange, and red. This really was written as guidance, not policies or you have to do it, but things to consider should we get to the red zone. We weren't in the red zone when we wrote this a week ago. A lot of us are in the red zone now. Mm -hmm. Um, So this is fluid. It's rapidly evolving. Um, I know that, you know, for us, the professional organizations, the American Academy and American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, as well as the Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, are updating the website constantly. Um, So, you know, for allergists, I'd say go to our parent organizations. For other specialists, I know your organizations are working on this. We hope that we can provide the blueprint for a lot of them to build off of, and that's the reason we wanted to get this out there so quickly. So... Going to the business angle of it, how we're going to keep these clinics in business, are insurance companies reimbursing for televisits now? Yeah, that's changing as well. So yes. Um, so there, there's specific guidance about the E and M codes that you can use as well as other you know, modifiers that you can include. There's, you know, and there needs to be some standardization to it as well. Uh, you can't just kind of go willy nilly and not document and things like that. So there's going to be some templates and uh, it'll be a bit of a steep learning curve. Um, but we're going to learn how to do it. And now that we have the insurance companies on board, uh, this may ultimately shift the way we provide these services even after this pandemic you know, has resolved. I really hope so. I think it would be a, you know, and again, I think whether it's a phone call, a text message, a Skype conversation or FaceTime conversation, we should be communicating with patients the way we communicate with everyone else and way the way co- patients want to communicate with us. And we've been slow to do that, I think, partially because of reimbursement issues, cultural issues, and then also I think a fear of, well, are we going to get sued if we don't lay hands on the patient? I can't get paid if I don't do an exam. But so much can be gleaned from an image and a, a voice inflection and body language that you can get through these teleplatforms. Um, so I, I think this is, this is going to be very helpful. So the business angle of it, I think people have to talk to their insurance companies and say, what are the codes, right? And from a safety standpoint, again, you talked about different zones that you have. People can look at those guidelines. Other thoughts on the safety side of it? Yeah, I think we all have to adapt to the, the current situation. And um, you know, some of our colleagues are, are very conservative. Uh, they won't make specific recommendations unless they go through X, Y, and Z first. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just need to adapt. And Um, We need to change our approach to using diagnostic tests. Um, We need to use our ability as physicians uh, to take a detailed clinical history, use our understanding of the differential diagnosis, use our understanding of likelihoods in regards to causes um, and, you know, know, in regards to the assessment and, and, and medical plan. And ultimately, we have to employ shared decision making. And this is the great time for all of us to practice it and say, listen, I can't lay hands on you. I I can't get, you know, all the information I normally would. Here are my thoughts. What's important to you? What are your values? How much risk do you want to take? Do you want to, you know, try this approach or that approach? Um, We need to get away from, you know, just putting everybody into a pigeonhole and saying you have to do it this way. That's not the case anymore. It's not one size fits all. So we need to adapt to that and get creative. And ultimately, we can then follow up because this will make it a lot easier. I don't need you to wait and, and take time off work and come back to the office for a follow-up visit. Give me a call. We'll set up a time where we can you know, do telehealth or a phone call and see how things are going. Things mm. aren't going well, we'll adjust the plan. Dave, one of the things that is driving caregivers around the country to distraction is this idea that we don't have enough PPE, personal protective equipment. And in the outpatient world, I imagine it could even be worse because typically we don't like stock tons of N95 masks. So how, how are you guys thinking about that? Yeah, you know, people need to be prepared. And I don't believe that there's enough PPE to go around. Well, we know there's not enough to go around, especially if you're out in the community on your own. And 
in a private practice or outpatient setting. You have a patient with suspected or known COVID-19, you have to gown up, you have to wear um, gloves, you have to have an N95 mask on, although the CDC keeps, you know, it's a moving target in regards to what they recommend for type of mask, but it's only because we're running out of the mask. Because we're running out, yeah. Yeah, and you have to have eye, eye equipment as well. You need to protect your eyes with goggles or a face shield. Um, you know, how many of these offices actually have that already? If they don't have it now, how are they going to get it in the middle of a crisis like this? And even if they do have it, I strongly encourage them to, you know, run through mock drills with all the staff at the start of every day. Where do we have the equipment? What do we do when a patient walks in who sends up the red flag because they're high risk? How do we handle that? Who do we call? How do we handle testing? What's available in our, in our area? And really just stay on top of this and practice it day in and day out uh, because that situation is going to arise if it hasn't already. Yeah, a, a thousand percent. And again, we don't have all the answers for this, you know, but we better be asking the right questions and we better be trying to find those answers and preparing. And, you know, the thing is, I hope this teaches us a lesson that this is something we should have really had on our radar. We knew this was coming. We've seen it in 1918. We've seen it in other uh, outbreaks. And now's our time to really say, okay. And also, I think we have to hold leadership, especially in the smaller community hospitals and stuff that are struggling in general, we have to hold them accountable and say, you know what, this is a part that you work with the clinicians and start to make sure we're resourced to do this. Because, you know, I think I saw some figure cited somewhere that, you know, for the cost of one day of running an ICU, you can staff your hospital with enough N95 and PPE to weather most storms. And we haven't really done that. So it's a question of priorities that are gonna have to change moving forward. So Dave, any parting thoughts to prepare clinicians on the front lines for the coming storm that's already pretty much here in many places like the Bay Area? Yeah, you know, um, when you live in places like where you are and I am, this is happening. Uh, it, it's happening, it, it's right now. Um, you know, we're, we're transitioning towards telemedicine as we speak and it's been inspiration to see our leadership at my institution really you know, acknowledge this and, and, you know, help us help patients. So we're going to be able to help our patients. Um, for those who aren't in that situation yet, you will be, uh, whether you, you want to be or not. Um, now is the time to prepare. Uh, you can't prepare enough. Um, figure out what your resources are. What are your limitations? Where are the challenges going to lie? And what do you need to do? Um, and then I like your, your use of the word um, priority. We all have to prioritize at this point because that's what this comes down to. So if you're an outpatient practice, what patients can you already transition? What's truly non-essential? For those that aren't non-essential and still need to be seen, how are you gonna handle that? Uh, so one example with allergen immunotherapy, there's a lot of people, you know, venom immunotherapy is a life-saving thing for people that can die from a bee sting. We still need them to be able to come in and get their shots. Mm -hmm. People getting biologic therapy for asthma because they keep getting in the hospital due to exacerbations. How are we gonna get them in the office? Well, if you pull out the non-essential outpatient visits, it clears up your schedule. You can figure out a way to get them in safely to limit their contact with other patients and staff and make it work. But you need to prepare and plan ahead. Okay, what you just said, I wanna emphasize as our final point, that it's prioritization, it's a kind of triage. The worried well, the patients who can be seen by telemedicine, the people who can have phone calls, the people who can wait there has to be a process to make sure that happens, which means you have to have a process to be able to see them remotely and be reimbursed, or you will go out of business because you're not caring for anybody if you can't keep the lights on and pay your staff. And then the second thing is those vulnerable patients, like you said, who need these therapies on a regular basis, they need to come in, and that's true for rheumatology, it's true for internal medicine, it's true for pediatric allergy, it's true for adult allergy, it's true for a lot of different specialists and primary care people and obstetricians that has to be our priority in terms of figuring out how to keep those patients safe because I think there otherwise would be so much collateral damage from this outbreak and pandemic. So that all being said, Diamond Dave, I wanna thank you for sharing your wisdom and your team and your collaborators for making this document, which we will, these guidelines, which we will link to in the comments. Any parting thoughts? Uh, we're all in this together. We're gonna get through it. Um, we'll figure it out uh, because we always do. Uh, but, you know, we, we need to act. We have to act and we need support and resources. Um, but, yeah, thanks for having me on because uh, I, I really do fear for our, our colleagues out in the community and I want to help them however we can. Yeah. I am with you and I like this form of social distancing because I can <laughs> admire the fact that you look like a physician, Freddie Mercury, and that's important to me. But before we go, there's a... There's a um, have you seen the CDC, the different mustaches for the N95s? I have. They all have names. 
Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they all have names. So I'm going with the Selleck right now. I think. Oh, I like um, it. But I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> you know what? Can I be your Higgins? <laughs> <laughs> I would be honored, Z Dog. I'd be honored. <laughs> all right, guys. Z Pack. Please share this video. Uh, thank you to all the supporters for making stuff like this happen. Allergy Kids Doc, kids with an S, on Twitter and Instagram, and we'll link to the other stuff we talked about, the guidelines, et cetera. Stay safe out there, and we out. Peace.